good morning, everyone from all over the world. Uh, I, I have this honor just to, 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 to start this training. I just uh, choose this title, A Word of Sugars, but you know, I wanted to ask also a subtitle, Carbohydrate for Dummies, because I don't know exactly you know, what is your level of knowledge, so I'm sure that our students are very uh, also educated people in, in that science. So please, please take, take it you know, with a grain of salt because you know, it's, it's gonna be a general presentation of what we, what we do, what we plan to do, and the things we are facing in the world of glycoscience. So you see the first slide, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an amazing slide because it shows some of the monosaccharides with different orientation, configuration, and the big, there is also you know, sucrose. Because whenever we talk, okay, can I have now, uh, I have to, 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 I have to change my presentation. No, no, I have to push. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, now I have, oh, oh. You can choose to, to yeah, share your- Yeah, now, now, now I have to, 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 to make sure that I can change my, okay, okay, good, very good. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, when we, when we talk about sugars, you know, everyone thinks about sucrose. And of course, sucrose is a very important component of our field. It's, it's a fantastic disaccharide. Uh, it's now produced, you know, as a, a molecularly pure product with about 145 million tons per year. A little bit of history, sucrose uh, was discovered in New Guinea. And he, then they, he, he went to India. And so in India, this is where the name of, of Sakara uh, was, was given to this very nice product. And Sakara means grain. And from Sakara, we have saccharose, we have all the uh, things which we know now about sucrose. And then, you know, by several, uh, several travels, he just, uh, uh, reached Persia, then uh, went to in, from from India, then went to Spain, and from Spain, of course, you know that was a time of discovery, and uh, so people realized that uh, planting uh, sugar cane was most efficient into this part of the world, and of course this is a tragedy because this is uh, the beginning also of, of this extreme slavery, and uh, that you know took place over several hundred of years. And now the, the, the good point is that, you know, we, we are becoming slave, our safe, slave of sucrose. And we think that a significant part of the obesity that uh, our world is facing may be related to, uh, uh, to consumption of sucrose. Okay, I don't want to go much into that. So what do you mean by sugars? We, we are referring to a very vast family of molecules that are homogeneous and very diversified. They are all made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So this is what we refer them as carbohydrates in English. Hydrate de carbon in French, hydrate in, in uh, German, saccharides, and so forth. And uh, we, we have uh, several families. One family is, is uh, oligosaccharides, the other one is polysaccharides. And then uh, with respect to a lot of biological implication, we have the so-called glycoconjugate, glycopeptide, glycoprotein, and glycolipids, and I will go uh, more into the details of that. So whenever we have always a difficulty in describing our science, because we can talk about sugars, we can talk about carbohydrates, we can talk about oligo or polysaccharides, and we can talk about glycans. So we will be, I will be using these different words, you know, over my presentation. In terms of molecular diversity, of course, we have the chiral molecules, so we have the L and V shape of sugars, and then they are formed in the in in form of carbon chain, going from three to 10 carbon atoms, and all the carbon atoms are functionalized. So also they're characterized by the coexistence of a carbonyl group, and we have also hydroxyl groups, which are forming aldoses and ketoses, and they display a very interesting character, which is electrophile and nucleophile. So that's about all the chemistry that I will be showing. This is just to set the scene. 
Quite interestingly, we don't have only sugars on Earth, but also sugars have been uh, discovered in space not too long ago. And uh, so there has been a report of this glycoaldehyde molecule, which has been identified in uh, not too far away from Earth, only 400 light years. And this is uh, some sort of, of, of moiety that we find in uh, ribose and that we find also, and, and going all the way from ribose to R RNA and DNA, and also some part which we find in, uh, in uh, our monosaccharides. So that's interesting. And we have also other evidence of the existence of sugars in space. Now, in terms of depiction, most of the time, whenever the students are taught about carbohydrate, this is what they are taught about. This is a famous uh, Fisher discovery, which, of course, made a good sense whenever, the, I mean, it was a fantastic discovery, but it's wrong in a sense of that uh, this linear type of representation of monosaccharide are wrong in terms of uh, their existence. So they have been then following up, you know, different type of presentation. So this is one type of presentation whenever we saw the relative orientation of the aggressive group. This has been also translated into this representation wherever we have also a three-dimensional vision. And more recently, because of the complexity of these sugars, and because also their general occurrence, different kinds of colors have been representing to this. So this is some sort of historical presentation at the evolution of the depiction of monosaccharide. Quite interestingly, uh, the fact that uh, Emil Fischer gave the deconfiguration to glucose was almost, he, he had a choice between L and D, and he took the good choice because the absolute configuration of sugar, of glucose, was only established in 1951 by this great crystallographer by food from the Netherlands. So it took about uh, 60 years or so before this configuration was established. Actually, a great progress has been made whenever uh, many scientists involving glycoscience uh, realized that it was required to define, to have convention, uh, to describe our, with a symbol nomenclature, to define the sugars. So this is a great paper because there are like, like 40 co-authors on this. And this is actually what we call SNFG, which uh, give colors to these different, to these eight different monosaccharides, and get, then give different shape to the exos, to the N-acetyl exosamine, and so forth. And this is how we are representing our sugars. And I strongly suggest to anyone starting in the field to use this symbol nomenclature to have the rest of the world understanding what they want to, to, to describe. In a small things now, where do carbohydrates stand in the scheme of the molecular paradigm as a central dogma of life science? They are supposed, they are always described as secondary metabolites. So secondary doesn't mean they are just the less important. So actually they are the product of very complex enzymic uh, uh, and the enzymic action, wherever enzymes are required, nucleotide sugars are required, and to give uh, birth to this complex oligosaccharide, this is here a polysaccharide, and to give also uh, birth to this complex glycolipid, which are also as important. So this is, this oligosaccharide, this carbohydrate, are not a direct product of a gene, and this is quite, of course, a complicated complication. So in terms of complexity of glycans, so this is just a, a, a slide which I borrow from our colleagues here that shows that we are dealing here with the carbohydrates, for example, in chloroplast, that here we have the chromosome, here we have other types of glycolipids here, and these are some sort of the information content that is found in genome, then the transcription leading to transcriptome, there, it goes there with much information. Then we go to proteome, where the translation to protein, which is also uh, an important set of information. And what we call today is a glycome, which shows that an extended amount 
of uh, information. And this slide here, this part of the slide here, shows the differences between the way bases, between the way amino acids are linked together in a very linear fashion. In contrast to what the carbohydrates are, there's a lot of possibility of linking these monosaccharides together. And for the first time for biological molecules, these particular molecules show some sort of multi, uh, possibility of, of branching, which of course complicated a lot the analysis and then the construction and the description of this. So this is the complexity of glycan which we are facing. So we don't say they are difficult molecules, they are just challenging. Now, since we are dealing with a different uh, community, we have to, to find a way to describe this molecule. So this is an example where this molecule, which is called Lewis X and salyl acid on core two, I mean, some people can understand what it means, which can be translated also in a IUPAC, in a condensed IUPAC type of presentation, which is correct, of course. But I'm not sure that everybody speaks IUPAC fluently. And if you are a chemist, you better have this type of presentation here and this molecule, which can make good sense. And you see the branching over the branching here. But if you are a biologist, you prefer to have this presentation here, wherever following the SNFG presentation, we have this galactose residue, we have this sucrose residue, we have salic acid residue, and so forth, which is fine. But actually, of course, if you are in biology, you would like to know where this particular motif occurs, you know, to which protein is it linked? And if you are doing cell membrane, you would like to understand where this molecule, maybe part of the glycolipid, is located into this membrane. However, none of these representations are available for bioinformatics. So the way to describe bioinformatics are several ways. This is one, the so-called glycocity, which is a way to describe the different components here and the different way these monosaccharides are linked together. This is lead. So there are other type of representation uh, available for uh, glycoinformatics, uh, but this one is still human readable. So, uh, other one, you know, like the one that Kyoko has been developing are less human readable. But this is of course a big issue in the field of glycoinformatics, how to encode the complex information about the issue. As I said, we are dealing with a very challenging molecule. So this is what I'm calling the isomer barrier. They have a high number of monomers. And of course, substitution also can occur to these monomers. They have different ways of connecting these different monomers. I show here the way of having the so-called beta and the so-called alpha type of configuration. And they can be linked to this position. So this should be two, three, four, six and so forth. And besides, they also have branching points. So these are for the difficulty in terms of isolating and characterizing this molecule, and of course, the synthesis. In terms of the crystallization, they are only very difficult to crystallize. The only sugar which is easy to crystallize is sucrose. So it was complicated to get three-dimensional structure of, of, of carbohydrate. In terms of uh, chemical synthesis, they are also quite uh, challenging. And uh, the, as I said, you know, they are not a direct product of a gene, so they are different from proteins, and they cannot be amplified by PCR, so are different from nucleic acid. So these are the different points which we have to face in order to move forward in our elucidation, understanding, comprehension, and to see how this molecule participates in a very important biological uh, effect. So to summarize, so this is my, my, my slide, whenever you say, okay, whenever you deal with nucleic acid or with protein, you have here a linear sequences, we can translate these sequences. And this, for example, can be read saying, okay, I am hemoglobin. Whenever we deal with the free dimension, with structure of carbohydrate, we have to not only be able to construct this molecule and to understand how they interact with or do with the rest of the world. And this could be, for example, the signal for this molecule saying, I am a cancer cell. 
as I say, many people speak English, not as people for the time being speak, to be speak uh, Chinese. And the, again, you know, this is the difficulty of deciphering the meaning of this structure. And uh, as I said before, in bioinformatics, the difficulty to encode the structure is quite small. So a few examples, I don't want to go too much into that. We characterize oligosaccharides and polysaccharide. They are structurally complex molecules and they have a lot of functional diversity. So we found this oligosaccharide and polysaccharides all over in your life. The oligosaccharide, by definition, they are composed of four to 10 monosaccharides. And sometimes there is a result or the transformation of the degradation of polysaccharide. You know some of them, dextrin, fructose oligosaccharide and galacto oligosaccharide that are quite used, quite studied in human nutrition. We of course know the cyclodextrin. And more recently, there have been, of course, this discovery of human milk oligosaccharide. And now we have the possibility of going through synthesis and also biosynthesis of this human milk oligosaccharide, which can be uh, synthesized and produced in a very high and pure quality and added to formulas. So this is an added value also of this oligosaccharide. For polysaccharides, we have even a, a, an increased diversity they are used as energy storage. I will go into that. They are used also as structural support. So this is corn, uh, uh, structural support. This can be cellulose, but that can be chitin here. There's plasticity as well. Plasticity at the component of the cell wall polysaccharide. These are pectin, which are also important for industrial application. And these algae, algae are full of polysaccharide. And then we have this uh, polysaccharide, which are involved in blood clotting, and also the many important polysaccharides which form the extracellular matrix. So as you can see here, there is a diversity of role and function, which is fantastic, and which still has to be fully discovered. So this is my, uh, my slide, and uh, that talk about starch. If you look at all this field, I mean, human today, we have been living on these resources for almost 10,000 years. So they are different. We have rice, we have potatoes, we have corn, we have wheat. But if you extract a component of these, you will find the, here the starch granules. You see, they're all different, different in size, different in morphology. But if we look at this granule under polarized light, they all show a different, this common aspect, which is a Maltese force that indicates there is a crystalline order into each of these granules. And the name of the game was to understand how these things are put together. So that's again, you know, an illustration of having the, 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 the granules here and how these granules can produce a very nice uh, views on the microscope. Now I will show you a movie, which is here, which has, and uh, okay, which has sound. This is a magnification factor. We go from one.
Serge, there's no yes. sound here. Is there sound? Sorry? Is there sound? Did you say there is sound? There yes, is sound. You, don't, you don't have the sound? No. Oh, sorry. It's very, very low, in fact. Okay. Ah. Maybe can you volume up your audio? Maybe we can. Hear. I'm sorry for the sound. Is that better? No, we can't hear you. This oh, you can hear. Okay, sorry. Okay. So that was my, my Google start, you know, <laughs> whether... Um, okay. Now I have to stop these things. Ah, shit. Up, 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 up. Ah, I cannot stop it. Maybe you can ah. stop sharing your screen and then go uh, back. Maybe I can stop sharing the screen. How do I do so? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And the top of the of your screen? Yeah, yeah, but okay, okay. So that's it. Are you, are we, are, we are back now, eh? Yeah. Uh, so again, you know, so going to starch, as, as I said, only glucose. And this is, this is made, you know, a very simple way, in a sense, glucose molecule, which are linked alpha 1,4. So this is the amylose component. But the most important part is the amylopectin, which shows a lot of branching. And the, 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 the challenge, was to identify how these things are put together because they are the natural reserve of energy of all plants. And it took us several years to go from uh, the understanding that starting from a glucose residue, they were forming double helical structure, which has parallel stranded. This is double helical structure. Then these double helical structures are put together in the form of a crystalline platelet, which can con contain maybe 500 or so of this double helical structure. These platelets are organized into what we call blocklet. And the organization of the blocklet follows a very nice principle, which is a so called phytotactic principle that governs most of the morphology of the plant. And these blocklets are put together into layers here, which are responsible by the organization to the things which we see under polarized light. So now we have a consistent description of a five or six orders of magnitude of the different ways starch granule is made up. And this is still maintaining a high density of matter because this is a reserve of energy. And by analogy, now I say, this is what I described to you, going from the glucose to starch. But I, have, I, I like to draw this analogy because with also the one here, which is of course the one to maintain information. Each of the key things in nature, energy for plants, genetic information, they start from a double helical structure made on a polysaccharide backbone. So, and having the same repeat unit, about 200, two nanometers. Here we have anti-parallel anti things. Here we have a parallel organization, but they still follow the same sort of organization, architecture, overall five orders of magnitude. So to me, this is a very uh, stimulating observation of thinking that we can draw from all this talk. 
Now we, we, we change gear and we go back, back bacterial polysaccharide. So we heard about uh, the gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria. They contain a significant amount, a very important amount of, the, of the carbohydrate. We have the peptidoglycan. The way they are built together is different between the things. And we have here, for example, a very important lipopolysaccharide. Which, find, which is found in the gram-negative uh, bacterial endotoxin. And here we have the components of the, of the, the peptidoglycan. They all serve as protective layers of all these, bacterial, uh, all these bacteria, and understanding how they are put together is still not completely understood. And this would be also a nice step forward to understand that, just to have also a, a, an intelligent way to, to fight uh, this, uh, this bacteria. But these bacteria, they also produce polys exopolysaccharide. So they, for example, um, this exopolysaccharide, they are, they are playing a vital role in the maintenance and functioning of the biofilm. And they contribute also to the pathogenicity and the antifungal resistance of the bacteria. They are produced by a, a lot of bacteria here. Just, I just mentioned lactic acid bacteria, which are so useful for, for functional properties and industrial application. And these polysaccharides are used, you, you, you know most of them, because they are used as thickeners, as stabilizers, and so forth. And there are, for example, cellulose is also produced by bacteria, chitosan also. Hyaluronic acid is also produced by bacteria. But also, we can find a new bacteria in extreme marine habitats. And we have also now this exopolysaccharide, which are uh, more and more identified in microalgae. So there is all world of new structures to be discovered in this case. The things of proteoglycan, I mentioned that before, in terms of extracellular matrix, they are forming that we have a core protein to which one or more covalently attach a glycosaminoglycan, and they occur in the connective tissue of the extracellular matrix. The components are known to most of us, chondroitin sulfate, keratin car 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 sulfate. Most of the people know, know, know hyaluronic acid because hyaluronic acid is used also in cosmetic. So this is to make you look uh, uh, nice. And uh, heparin as well. Heparin, of course, it's a, it's, it's a tremendously important uh, product because it is injectable blood thinner and catalyzes the anticoagulant activity of antithrombin. And the bioactive moiety of vaparin, which is responsible for this particular expression of, uh, of uh, functionality, it's this pentasaccharide, which is some sort of an accident in this long chain. And this pentasaccharide now, it took several years, of course, several decades of research to identify the, the pentasaccharide and to grow for uh, chemistry, uh, chemical synthesis of this uh, pentasaccharide. That was a tremendous, tremendous achievement by our community to make these drugs, which is now fully available. But heparin is also involved in a significant amount of interaction uh, with the so-called heparin binding protein with enzymes, with lipoprotein, that also has a growth factor, and so forth and so forth. So you have a list here of all the interaction that heparin is taking place. So a unique and very important component. Now let me see from dream to reality. So this is actually what the people from cosmetic would like you to look at. Most of the time, this is a way that people in biology would like to uh, consider a cell. Quite nice. Actually, this is a dream. The reality is more like this one. Wherever, you know, we have this, uh, this poor guy here, but here we have also this glycocalyx. This glycocalyx occurs at all the periphery of the cell. It's very essential, but for the time being, there is a lot of understanding to go to, to, to characterize uh, this, uh, this different polysaccharide or that will conjugate, which are here, and have a tremendous role in terms of the protection of the bacteria, but also in terms of the interaction of the bacteria. So this is the whole field of, of glycoconjugate. 
where even we, we realize they are complex and there is recognition. So again, this is a, a, a drawing whereby some glycoprotein, some glycolipids have been represented. As you can see, they are just at the periphery of the cell, and they, of course, play a tremendous role in the cellular, in the social life of the cell, so to speak. And this is an example again, a famous uh, electron microscopy representation of a glycocalyx as regards to the cytosol here, that display, that shows the, the, the role of these uh, conjugates. So these glycoconjugates, they form a very large family of, uh, of uh, glycomolecules. We have uh, glycolipids, we have, uh, where we, have, we have the lipids like ceramide and so forth, which are linked to the glyco. There are the, the lipopolysaccharides, where these polysaccharides are anchored to the membrane lipid. As the whole families of glycoproteins, and this also includes the proteoglycan, the peptidoglycan are there also, covalently due to, to peptide. And then we have also the glycopeptide, which result from the degradation of oligopeptide linked to oligosaccharide. So this is a very, very important family. And uh, it's this glycoconjugate. They are key mediators in the cellular social life uh, that we are dealing with. So this is true for bacteria. And again, I show the uh, gram positive and the gram negative bacteria. This is true in human and animals. That's true also in the plants, where this interaction are playing a role into the growth of the plant, into the protection of the plants. But this is also true in viruses and in fungi. So all these glycans are playing a critical function in the areas of cell signaling, molecular recognition, immunity, and inflammation. And this is also one of our duty to understand that. Key things which occur for this glycoconjugate are keywords which are the multivalency, affinity, and ability. Actually, most of these glycan binding protein, which are important in you know, all the recognition events I just suggested, these glycan binding proteins are multiple binding sites, or they oligo oligomerize to achieve multivalency. And this is, for example, here, wherever we have a cell which has a different uh, way to interact with this lectin, or we have also a long chain here. So multivalency is a way to facilitate cell-cell interaction directly or indirectly. And when we talk about multivalency, then we have to address two issues. Issues of affinity. The affinity is a well-known, of course, co uh, concept uh, in drug design and so forth. Wherever you have this here, the drawing of this uh, monoclonal antibody, this antibody, and we, we know what, what it means by affinity. But also we have always to consider the avidity, how much of these things are interacting. Because most of the time the interaction between the glycan and the protein is not, is not very high. But actually the sum of this interaction, which, and we call it about velcro like type of interaction, makes the recognition process to occur. And this is quite unique to our field. And sometimes people developing uh, drugs would consider most of taking, talking about the affinity, but about ability. And it's difficult to conceptualize. I mean, the concept is there, but to translate the concept of ability into a drug discovery. So a recapitulation of all this molecular interaction that, that involve carbohydrates, viruses, cancer cells, hormones, enzymes, antibodies, glycoconjugate, lectins, which are important, toxins, and bacteria. So I name most of them, and this is, of course, a, a, a very popular slide in our field. Whenever we talk about some of them, we have also uh, to consider the biosynthesis. And uh, the biosynthesis of this uh, cell, of this oligosaccharide, that's the glycan. I mean, it's a very complex uh, uh, process. We know the, the final details of this complex until recently. And this is this complex uh, that, uh, that takes place in the endoplasmic reticulums that goes through a series of uh, 
of linkage of synthesis, degradation, control of quality and so forth, to go to the Golgi and to be transferred as a block uh, to, 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 to the external part. And so this is a case of this N-linked and O-linked lichen, wherever we have, uh, they are very famous and very well studied nowadays, uh, with the asparagine linked here and the role, important role of, fuco, of fucose. And, and then the different uh, type of glycan, which are identified uh, as high hybrid complex. And we know also that these are the end glycan, but there are also the O glycan, which are linked on serine and threonine, which are smaller. And they are all composed from a series of limited amount of monosaccharides, which are shown here. And this end glycoprotein, they are just here. And they, like for example, these are the so-called decoration, which are more than decoration on, the, on a given protein. And you see they are important. Sometimes such a, a disac such a glycan here can cover up to 400 square, Armstrong square, which means they are playing a role, not only in terms of recognition, but also in terms of physical, physical chemistry. They are just uh, assuring some stability. They are also solubility. They can go for epitope masking, and also they can be involved or not involved in interaction or recognition. So first of all, I'm trying to identify the nature of this glycan, their location on a given protein, and understand their role in the recognition and protection is also a key point, key area of research in the glycoside. So I give you some example about sugars and infection. I mean, this is like a timely because we are facing a very difficult time. And we should be just flu virus and glycan. This slide here shows a, a summary of the different uh, flu virus uh, episode, which we have. We, we, we usually have the seasonal flu, which is essentially affecting humans but also we have the so-called H1N1, which is referring to the Spanish flu in 1919 that killed over four, 40 million people in, in Europe. And then this uh, has been evol uh, changing. So H means for hemagglutinin and for neuraminidase. This one is responsible for recognition, for interaction, and this neuraminidase is responsible for cleaving and they are acting on a very uh, simple, similar, as seen like that, type of, uh, of glycan. And the only difference between the so-called avian glycan and the, the human glycan is in nature of the branching here of the salic acid on the core here, galactose plaque. In one case, we call it, it's uh, referred as being too free linked, and the other one is two things linked. So if you just have a look here on a piece of paper, you don't see too much difference, but actually the three-dimensional differences are quite, in, are quite important, which of course is a relief because we wouldn't like to have a, too much of a mutation for this viral uh, to interact with this one. So the, the way that human and avian receptor uh, interact you know, with hemagglutinin, and of course this is what essentially happened in China wherever there is a, a, a closeness between human beings, between uh, pigs, and between also hens here, and which, is, which are forming reservoir for a propagation of this uh, avian here. And again, I show the differences between the two six and the two three, yeah? which you can see better, because if you look at the primary representation here, yeah, that's how you can see, alpha 1.6, beta 1.4, you don't see too much difference. So the virus strain, so are just uh, called according to this uh, surface protein. So this would be H1N1. And I show this one. So H1, H, uh, hyaluronic, uh, hemagglutinin here is responsible for binding the virus to the cell via the salic acid on the membrane. So there is here the insertion, imagination of the virus. And the neuraminidase catalyze the hydrolysis of salic acid and which allows budding and release of the virus. So these are the key events. So I, I just have to apologize for, for any colleagues in virology because this is very 
preliminary type of uh, presentation, but it gives you the figures. So whenever we go about uh, this lectin binding, so this is what is seen in the electron microscopy, and we have been, uh, the three-dimensional structure of this structure of this has been solved, and this occurs as a trimeric protein, and these are the binding sites of this primary protein shown here onto the salic acid. And these are providing the anchoring point for, uh, <laughs> for the virus to enter. Comparison has been made also between the avian and the human hemagglutinin, between the so-called uh, H3 avian, the so-called Hong Kong episode in 1968, and the human one, the Spanish one. And the differences here are in the different type of amino acid which are involved into the binding. They are not, they are not too, too, too much different. The, 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 the tricky point is, of course, uh, uh, with neuraminidase, which cleaves the salic acid on our cell. And then in this case, the crystal structure has been solved. So this is a tetrameric protein also. And this is a, the, the linkage to the salic acid. And this is responsible for the budding. From these things, conception of neuraminidase have been, have been tainted. So the first one, so there are inhibitors. So the first one has been shown here. So N1 with acid, with salic acid. Second one is, of course, a famous Tamiflu. So, the, so, the, so this has been devised knowing the three-dimensional structure of all this interaction and, and doing a lot of very, very subtle, very nice organic synthesis. So that led to Tamiflu. And the, the real enzyme was, was developed afterwards again from uh, this particular knowledge of three-dimensional structure. So I'm stressing the word of three dimension because I, I will talk about that in the afternoon, but we have to understand you know, how these things go. And this is, for example, a, a, a molecular dynamic simulation of the, of the influenza baryon. And you see in, in yellow here, we have neuraminidase. In orange, we have the hemagglutinin. And there are interactions. So nowadays, we are capable of running molecular dynamic simulation for a long time, trying to understand how these molecules behave, whether, for example, there is a, a, a bivalent, there is spacing between the so-called spike protein to make it compatible with bivalent antibody association and so forth. So this is a present status of knowledge in terms of structure and also dynamics and interaction with the membrane. I will finish here with oligosaccharide as antigen determinant, giving a list of tumor cell markers, of tumor cell markers, of cellular adhesion, and so forth. And I will finish by, by the simple example of blood group antigen. So I will skip two slides, which are important, two series of slides, which are important in terms of, of xenoantigen, finishing with a sugar infection saying that the sugars are varying from one species to the other one. And this was a discovery of glycan and blood groups by this uh, Landsteiner. So the, this, this gentleman was so famous, they made a stamp in his honor. But actually, he was not the only one. There was this also great lady, uh, Dr. Watkin. So we made ourselves a stamp to recognize our contribution. So this is a blood group antigen, whether made of very simple sugars Glucnac, galactose, and acetyl galactose, I mean, and glucose, they are making the so called blood group O, blood group A, and blood group B with very, very uh, tiny differences. The tiny differences, which are fantastically important in terms of the blood transfer and so forth. And so, this is an example where we have the so called A, B, and O system. So that this A and B system, I showed them here, O antigen, which is devoted at the side chain here, here. And they are on glycoproteins and glycolipids in the red cell membranes. And they also occurs on most cells and tissues in human and animals. So they are here. And of course, we have to understand more about that. But there is a very striking observation that uh, the worldwide distribution of human blood groups is not the same. And we have zones in our uh, planet, wherever there is more O zones here, yeah? zones wherever that uh, A zones with the blood group A and B zones. 
For example, A <coughs> is quite is quite uh, prominent in, uh, in in Europe and is less prominent in other parts of, of, the, of the world. And some some word has been work has been made to make a relationship between the occurrence of these zones here and also to the existence of epidemia. So people are, have, have, been, have been relating the, 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 the occurrence, the influence of black uh, plague in Europe, and though that only the, um, basically most of the people carrying the A zone, you know, survived from this epidemia. In contrast, other uh, cholera has been also uh, addressed here, and then a bit of the people surviving cholera would be more likely to display a particular type of blood group, and the same also for malaria. So this is also some sort of, uh, of uh, vision that we may have that uh, we don't know exactly what's, uh, what's the role of these uh, blood group substances, but uh, what we think that our sugars are the results of the co-evolution between animals and microorganisms, and the course is that, uh, so this is my wife, Anne Emberti, which, who, who prepares this slide here. Yeah? So the result of evolution, and uh, so that uh, we think that the biological role and significance of the glycans on our cells is actually to create and generate diversity. So that's about uh, what I wanted to describe. Of course, this is a very uh, broad description, you know, but very light description because I could not go into the details of the, all these things just to show that we have an immense task in front of us of uh, trying to identify, characterize, construct, understand the, how this mechanism go together. And glycoinformatics is important because it's putting all the significant amount of information together uh, from which we can draw conclusion. And I wanted to address you uh, to this article that uh, Frederic and uh, Davide and myself published in the, in the blog, Glycopedia. And uh, this article probably is a description of uh, what are the tools which are available in, uh, in uh, bioinformatics, uh, in the cyberspace, which are available if you want to address uh, issues regarding the analysis, regarding the characterization, the representation, the occurrence of all of these, uh, these uh, very fascinating molecules, and to move forward in the understanding of the role and function of these. And so that was my, my presentation, which is uh, hopefully finishing time. <laughs>